My uncle was involved in politics and they had an office in Kansas City and he wrote me a letter asking if I wanted to go to one of the academies. And I said, no, I want to join the Marine Corps. My two scout masters have joined the Marine Corps. I want to follow them. They were at Pearl Harbor when the attack occurred and they survived. I want to follow them. Actually, we left school our junior year and hitchhiked to Kansas City to join the Marine Corps. This other kid and I got orders to report to the gunnery sergeant Flynn in the main lobby immediately. And we did. And gunnery sergeant Flynn was a, a real old, tough gunnery sergeant. And he, when we got down there, he said, All right, girl, you're going home. Your mommy's called. And you, you felt about so high, <laughs> but, but actually our fathers, our dads came to Kansas City and picked us up. We were 16, and the Marine Corps didn't care, but my mother did. <laughs> and she, she raised hell, and we, we had to come home, and did, we did the same thing the next year, as soon as football. Season was over. We left school. It's I actually went to Kansas City on a diesel. They called it the Doodle Bug, a diesel car. Diesel car with carried mail. Anyhow, we went to Kansas City and we enlisted in the Marine Corps. And as I say, if you were big enough, they didn't care. But at that time, my mother gave up. She knew I was going to do it. I was 17 when I joined the Marine Corps. By the time I was on active duty, I was 18. But that's really not very old. And I think you ought to be 21. More you do. I think I think 18, 18 too young. They'd be. I think you'd be better off. They'd understand more. If you were 21, as I say, if you were big enough, they didn't care. But at that time, my mother gave up. She knew I was going to do it because my scoutmasters had both joined the Marine Corps, and they both survived Pearl Harbor. And one of them was, went to, on Bougainville, and the other one went on Guadalcanal. And they both, they actually, they both survived the war. And one of them came back and became an actor in California. The other came back to Kansas, and he was in the initial Kansas Highway Patrol. His name was Jack West, and he be, became an icon in the Kansas Highway Patrol. He is, Jack West is a legend in the Kansas Highway Patrol. It was, you know, this was. 1936 when the Ohio Patrol started. So uh, these guys have all been, always been my heroes. They were my, my scout master. I, at that time, I was really big in in Boy Scouts, and one thing led to another, and I joined the Marine Corps. Went to California. Went to boot camp in San Diego. Went to additional training at Camp Pendleton, which was pretty much a sheep pasture at the time. I had heard a little bit about it because my friends had been in. Uh, the two friends had been in actually had been home once and talked about what it was like. So I knew a little bit about what it would be like. The, uh, the troops, the group you'd be in, and the, the, the friendship you develop, and the what you do, what you expected of your friends and colleagues, and you may you may made, made some friends. It, it was a very dangerous thing. 
he made some friends. And actually, when you, you remember the rest of your life. You didn't see him that much. But we did go back to California once and see, see one of my one of my best friends I've been in the Marine Corps with and been in action with. So. It was a, I think, a consuming thing it was to me. At the time, I, I decided I wanted to be a career Marine. It wasn't until later I decided that it probably wasn't the best thing for me. When I was at Camp Pendleton, I was expecting training on a specific weapon. And I, I had a choice of a 75 millimeter half track or a 37 millimeter field gun. And I chose the 37 millimeter field gun and we, we trained on, on a field gun and went overseas with the field gun. We went to San Diego, our boot camp was in San Diego, and, and the further training was at Penland, which is right near San Diego. And then we shipped out of San Diego, went aboard a troop ship, and went parallel to the coast up to San Francisco. I never, never got seasick. The, the roughest portion of our trip was parallel to the coast, going from San Diego up to, to San Francisco. It really, really, really rough. Uh, I never got sick. I, I remember one guy, yeah, a lot of guys were sick, I and mean, it was really rough. And the guy was leaning over the edge, had to, had to dry heaves. And then a guy, a friend of mine, came up and said, what? Tapped him on the shoulder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Went into San Francisco Bay and joined a, a convoy of a great number of ships. And form, actually formed a convoy of troop ships zigzagging all over the ocean and uh, uh, working with uh, fighting ships that protected the, the convoy we were with, the, the troop ships we were with. The troop ships were very austere. Uh, you had hot, our freshwater shower once a week. If you wanted to take a saltwater shower, that was your problem. It's not not very good. But the uh, the uh, toilets were simply rows of seats all together in a kind of a trough, where the water ran ran through the trough, and he sat on the seats and. There was always some clown, if you were sitting there, and they'd roll up a bunch of toilet paper and set it on fire, which was quite a thrill. <laughs> but it was one of the typical things that they did to the new boots. And we were, we were considered boots. We, it, it, it was a typical troop ship, you know, bunks. Four high, pretty well packed. Uh, we, we, we had to we had to clean the ship. We were they called us passenger sweepers, man your broom, and sweep down all empty all butt buckets, clean all areaways, you know. On so, so we had to work, had to keep the ship clean as we went. We got we got aboard or got into Honolulu, Honolulu or yeah Hawaii, Baratania Street, Baratania Street, and you know you know I, I, I was I was just barely turned eighteen when we landed there and 
were walking ashore and a big row of people, guys were shooting dice, playing cards in this row. And we said, well, what's the deal? What are you in line for? Whorehouse. And uh, I was with an old gunnery sergeant I made friends with. And a girl or a woman leaned out of the window upstairs and said, come on up, Marine, I'll give you something you've never had before. And this old gunnery sergeant said, he swore that old bitch has got leprosy. <laughs> that was my introduction. I went into the replacement battalion on Saipan. I didn't really do anything on Saipan. We were just a replacement, 24th replacement battalion, to, to replace the guy that got killed and wounded on Roy Namur and, and Saipan before they got got stabilized. And, uh, we uh, became a gun crew on a 37 millimeter. But when we got ready to go to Iwo Jima, one of my, one of my seats, right? I never had a 19th birthday. We were combat loaded to go to Iwo Jima, and we took off near the 1st of February. We were to hit Iwo Jima on the 19th of February. And the second day out, we were up on the deck and I said, today's my birthday. And the guy said, well, when's your birthday? And I said, February 1st. He said, this is February 2nd. I said, wait a minute, what, what happened February 1st? We crossed the International Date Line and we lost February the 1st. Got it back later, but it wasn't as dramatic. <laughs> anyhow, I, that's one of my sea stories. I, I never had a 19th birthday. <laughs> so I'm really only 83. <laughs> we were supposed to be 37 millimeter gunners, but we were shorter, so 37 millimeter guns. So we became machine gunners. I, uh, I'd always been fascinated with, with weapons, and I, I took two weapons and a, uh, an old expert on machine guns kind of took a liking to me, and I became a machine gun instructor <laughs> because I, I'd had some instruction. From an ex-marine who lived in a little town where I lived, who gave us some instruction in automatic weapons when, when I was a kid in high school. I became a machine gun instructor. I, I loved automatic weapons. I thought they were great. And so, so I went, went into Iwo Jima, not as a 37 millimeter, but as a as a machine gunner. We were, I was actually in a machine gun crew, a seven-man seven crew. We, we had, well, you had a, a, a gun commander, a gunner, a loader, a loader two ammunition carriers, when there were any other, there were seven of us in, in the crew that did various things you had to, we carried a 30 caliber heavy machine gun, which is a water cooled gun. You could shoot a lot more bullets with it, but it was heavy. So we, we had that, that seven man crew to carry that 30 caliber. It, it has a barrel about so big around, and yeah, it has a tube where the water, water circulates through it to help cool the barrel and you can you can shoot about 30 caliber, 600 round, uh, I remember the 600, it's a pretty round, rapid fire, I don't remember exactly, 
but it's the same same muzzle velocity as an, an M1 rifle. Uh, it, it's a it's a very good weapon. E each night when we we dig in, somebody go back to get some fruit or something from headquarters to supplement our rice. The night I went went back. I was coming around some rocks and I almost ran into a Japanese kid. He, he, he was a big, he might have been Korean, but he was about as big as I was. And we came around this rock, came face to face, and I looked at him. He had one of our M1 rifles slung over his shoulder. And I had my rifle. And uh, I said, halt. And he looked at me and said, like hell. And ran like crazy. <laughs> he spoke English. He, he might have been Korean. He was, he was a big, big kid. He was in a Japanese uniform. And the next morning, we were dug in, waiting for the order to move out, and you would always try to have at least two awake in a hole at a time. So we look around. Seven were in, in our gun crew home. We'll try to have one guy looking out both sides. You weren't, you're never sure where the front was. Usually half, half round, and we, this other kid, was two or two on watch all, all the whole time. We were watching, it and the, this one kid was the kid was looking out to the left, left side, and he poked me and, and pointed, and there was a, a jab. I think the kid I'd seen the night before on the ground. And we watched and watched and very slowly we saw his hand start moving. And he had a M1 rifle slung over his shoulder. And he, he was slowly, slowly starting to move. And we watched and we watched. And all of a sudden, he jumped up and started to run. And I shot him. Yeah, and that's not something he liked. It's kill somebody. You know, they were trying to kill us. We were trying to kill them. And war isn't fun. But, and I was, uh, I, n I never, was in combat on a 37 millimeter crew. I was on a machine gun crew, and you're never sure how many you kill with a machine gun. But at least I know I, I killed one guy. A lot, a lot of noise connected with uh, shells and uh, damaged my hearing, and, and you know. Both the Japanese were shooting, and uh, they were shooting mostly mortars. And uh, we had artillery. We had 105 millimeter artillery behind us. And uh, not all the time did they shoot far enough. You know, we, <laughs> we, we had a few times where they would drop a shell in close to us. But it, it was a dangerous place to be. About the, the fourth day, we were up in an area that they, they, they call the, uh, the, the amphitheater. It was a kind of a rounded out thing where we were trying to move forward. And uh, they had a, a pillbox everywhere, the Japanese did. And we had a captain. Captain Joe McCarthy, 
not not the famous Joe McCarthy. Captain McCarthy was disgusted because we weren't moving forward, and he was kind of a wild man. He was a great commander, and you you know you, a guy like that you'd follow anywhere. And he he said, "Cover me." And I, and I had a thirty caliber light machine gun. Then and they were light enough you could pick them up shoot him and I was trying to cover him and he he had two forty five pistols and he started up toward this pillbox where the Japs were shooting and he had both pistols out shooting as he went forward and he actually drove them out and killed four of them and chased the other one off He wiped out two pillboxes and actually got the Congressional Medal of Honor. One of the one of the few who got the Congressional Medal of Honor on Iwo Jima and lived. And Captain Mack lived and he retired and lived in Chicago. Lived to a ripe old age. One of the few. Most, I'd say 50, 60 percent of the Congressional Medal of Honor winners on Iwo Jima were killed. We had a crew and we got caught in a, a mortar barrage, Japanese mortar barrage. There were seven of us in the crew. We got hit with, with a bunch of mortars. Um, two, got, two of the seven were killed and three of us were wounded pretty seriously and, and the, the, everybody was wounded some but the three of us were, were pretty serious everybody was either wounded or killed in our gun crew I, uh, I was hit with Japanese mortars and I still have two pieces of Japanese mortar in my right lung. When I got hit in the Marine Corps at that time, the Navy Corpsman, the Navy provided all the medical service for the Marine Corps at that time. And if you got in a firefight and you got hurt, you called for a corpsman. And the corpsman, they were unarmed, but they came up and they treated you. They tried to stabilize you. And uh, get you out of there alive. And as I said, the, the, all of our crew was either killed or wounded. And, uh, I got uh, when when Navy corpsman treated you, they gave you a shot of morphine and a two ounce bottle of hundred proof brandy. They had in their right, right hand side they had morphine and bandages and that kind of thing. The other side they had a a bag of hundred proof medical brandy and I think it goes back to the old grog in the old old Navy but you, if you got wounded you got a shot of brandy and it wasn't a bad deal and um, I, I got, got wounded and they sent ambulance jeeps up they, they rigged up jeeps so they could carry four four litters and um, I'd been hit and the guy forgot to mark, it's supposed to give you a shot, mark an X on your forehead to show that you had the shot. And they, they put me up on a deep, uh, ambulance deep, one of four, 
and, and the, the corpsman driving the Jeep, there were two of them, said, hey, this guy hadn't had a shot. You know, I, I got hit in the back, I could hardly talk. Uh, I was trying to, trying to tell him I really had had my shot, and I could hardly talk. I really, I couldn't talk. And he, he, he was lifting my head up, and he said, it's okay, Marine, we'll take care of you. And I was trying to say, I've, I've already had it. And finally, I said, oh, what the hell. So I had another shot of morphine and another two ounces of brandy. So I'd had two of each, and they loaded me on the Jeep and headed down down to the beach. And by the time I got to the beach, I didn't care whether the war. It kind of crossed my mind, you know, uh, if this is dying, it's not too bad. I was evacuated to Guam, and this, that doctor said, looks like you've earned a trip home, son. And I thought, well, that's okay. Then I got back to Pearl and was in the hospital there. And the doctors there said, young man, you healed up pretty well. And we spent a lot of money training you. We're going to return you to active duty. So what could I say? <laughs> you just... You just go. Got back to Pearl, and uh, I was still recovering. And uh, they said, "You know, we we spent a lot of money on you. Um, there's still a war to, to finish up. We're going to put put you to work." And they put me to work censoring, censoring mail, and. Uh, I was a censor, and I could actually I could write to my folks whatever I wanted to, but but I, I could cut out. You know, we didn't mark it out. We'd cut out things that people guys weren't supposed to say. Where they were, what they were doing, where they'd been, any anything about where where they'd been, and. You know, the, the war was winding down, and you know, another, another guy and I, that we'd known each other, we'd both been wounded, and we were, we were there uh, reading letters and cutting things out, and I, you know, I'd read it and I'd say, oh, what the hell, I'd send it anyhow, so it didn't matter, the war was <laughs> over, so you know, let a guy get what he could. We were all in the same boat, you know, it, it was, uh, you understood what they were saying, what they were trying to say, and, and trying to get by with, and at, at that point, it was to the point where and some of us didn't think it was worth cutting the guide letter up. Just go ahead and go ahead and send it. I have a friend. He, he's probably dead now. But he was in the Marine Corps. I didn't meet him till in school, but he was in Corregidor. And he was in the Japanese death march and survived. Survived, and, and he was a big, tough guy. But he, uh, they sent him to Japan, and he worked in a, a, a salt mine for three years, forced labor. <laughs> we were in a fraternity. Oh, I think it's funny. We were in a fraternity, and most of the pledge class were veterans. And this guy named Hawkins, Hal Hawkins, was a big guy. A Marine had been in, in Corregidor. He, uh, <coughs> he was a really nice guy, a very quiet man. But, uh, th th we were in, in this fraternity, and they were gonna gonna make us sleep in the dorm, and they were gonna get us up in the middle of the night and paddle us. And most of the press class was veterans, and they came pounding their paddle. A lot, a lot of them high school kids. 
on the stairs coming up, and we wouldn't let them in. And they threatened us and all kinds of stuff. But anyhow, we didn't let them in. And the next morning we had a big meeting, and this little guy who was the president used the word, he said, we have to have discipline. And he said discipline about three or four times. And this, this guy that survived the, the death march, Hal Hawkins, Hal stood up. He was a big bulky man. And he said, don't tell me about discipline. And this little guy said, okay, Hal. Sorry, Hal. <laughs> that way he was over. <laughs> Uh, Hal, Hal Hawkins, he, he, he was an architect, that's where I met him at school. He was an architect down in <clears throat> near uh, Branson, Missouri, hmm. and he, he's, he's older than I was, I, I'm, I'm sure Hal is dead by now, but he, he was a really great guy. Very, very calm, very quiet, but he's not a guy you'd, you'd want to fool with. Russ and I did not actually formally meet at all. Um, I did not even know his name. He came to a basketball game at my high school, and I was on one side of the little gymnasium, and he was on the other with a friend from Stafford, and they talked about me the whole time. I, and I knew they were talking about me, even though I didn't know who they were. And then. Um, he spoke to me after the game was over. I was waiting for the my boyfriend to come out of the locker room and he came by and said, I will be back. Does that sound like something from a movie? <laughs> and I said, oh sure, I know you will. Not believing he ever would and they left. Then he did call or sent me a letter from Stafford because I lived in Maxville, which is about 23 miles away, and asked me if he could come over and take me to a movie. And I, I said yes. Mm -hmm. And he came over and we had one date. He came over one more time and had, we had another.